Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event with Michelle Zahner and Hrishikesh Hirway, celebrating the launch of Michelle's debut book, Crying in, Crying in H Mart. My name is Jeffrey Nudin, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our virtual event space. Please let us know in the chat where you're from. We definitely wanna know where you're tuning in from tonight. Um, for those of you who are new to the workshop, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. At a time when our communities are specifically vulnerable, we continue to offer a space in which we imagine a more just future. You can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and YouTube, or um, visit aaww.org where the record, actually, aww.org is where you can find the latest news and updates. YouTube is where you can find a recording of this video once we're done tonight. Um, we're thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Books Are Magic who are providing um, a link to signed copies of Michelle's book in the chat. And you can also support one of our favorite local independent bookstores by purchasing her book. Um, I also wanna give a quick shout out to our partners at Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation tonight. During the event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from the event. We do have time for audience Q&A towards the end of the hour and you can send in your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on Zoom or if you're on YouTube in the live chat box. I'm going to briefly introduce Michelle and Rishi, and then I will. I hope you'll join me in welcoming welcoming Michelle on screen to read briefly from Crying in H Mart. Michelle Zahner is best known as a singer and guitarist who creates dreamy, shoegaze-inspired indie pop under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has won acclaim from major music outlets around the world for releases like Psycho Pump and Soft Sounds from Another Planet. Her forthcoming album, Jubilee, will be released this June. Crying in H Mart is her first book. Hrishikesh Hirway is the host and creator of Song Exploder, a podcast and Netflix, Netflix television series where musicians break down the creative process behind their songs. He's a musician himself and has released four albums under the name The 1 AM Radio and composed scores for film, television, and video games. Hershey is also co-host and producer of the podcasts Home Cooking and The West Wing Weekly, and executive producer of The Jump with Shirley Manson. He serves the Library of Congress as a member of the Digital Strategy Roundtable. Please join me again in welcoming Michelle and Hershey. And again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Over to you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I guess I'll start with the reading. Um, Rishi suggested I start with a passage on page 98, uh, which I thought was really interesting because it's one of the more difficult passages. Um, when, when I think in a food memoir, uh, food becomes sort of horrific and, and not so pleasant, um, but I, I'm, I'm excited to read it. Um, I will say that there might be a bit of a trigger warning for, for anyone who um, has difficulty with diets and, and calorie counting. It might be tr triggering for you. Um, the next morning, Kay was in the kitchen cooking jatjuk, a pine nut porridge my mother used to make for me when I was sick. I remembered her telling me that families make jatjuk for the ill because it's easy to digest and full of nutrients and that it was a rare treat because pine nuts were so expensive. I recalled its thick, creamy texture and comforting nutty flavor as I watched the porridge thicken in the pot. Kay stirred slowly with a wooden spoon. Can you teach me to make this? I asked. My mom said you could help me learn how to cook for her. I want to be able to help so you can make sure to take time to take breaks for yourself too. Don't worry about this one, Kay said. Just let me take care of it and you can help me by cooking dinner for you and your daddy. I wondered if I should try to explain how important it was to me that cooking my mother's food had come to represent an absolute role reversal, a role I was meant to fill, that food was an unspoken language between us, 
that it had come to symbolize our return to each other, our bonding, our common ground. But I was so grateful for Kay's help that I didn't want to bother her. I chalked these feelings up to the unwarranted self-involvement of an only child and decided if Kay wouldn't teach me, I should commit myself to another role. So I became the resident recorder. I wrote down all the medications my mother took, the times she took them, and the symptoms she complained of, learning how to combat them with the other drugs we were prescribed. I monitored the consistency and texture of her bowel movements, introducing laxatives when necessary as the doctor had suggested. In a green spiral notebook I kept by the phone in the kitchen, I began to obsessively notate everything she consumed, researching the nutritional value of every ingredient, calculating the calories in every meal, and adding them up at the end of the day to see how far we were from a normal 2,000 calorie diet. <clears throat> Two tomatoes made 40 calories. With a tablespoon of honey clocking in at 64, I figured we cleared 100 calories after my mother drank her morning tomato juice. She didn't like nutritional supplement drinks like Ensure because they were chalky and shake-like, but one of the nurses at the oncology center suggested we try Ensure Clear, which tasted more like juice. These my mother found much more palatable, which was a glorious victory. My father bought cases of every flavor from Costco and piled them up in our garage where my mother used to keep her cache of white wine. We tried to get her to drink two or three a day, compulsively refilling the wine glass from which she used to drink her Chardonnay. That brought us to at least six or 700. Misukara became another staple, a fine light brown powder with a subtle sweet taste we used to eat atop pupping soon in the summer. Once or twice a day, I would mix it with water and a little honey. Two tablespoons would edge us close to a thousand. For meals, Kay would prepare porridge or nudungji. She'd spread freshly cooked rice in a thin layer on the bottom of a pot, toast it into a crispy sheet, then pour hot water over it and serve it like a watery, savory oatmeal. For dessert, strawberry haagen provide a momentous win, clocking in at a whopping 240 calories for half a cup. My mother developed sores on her lips and tongue that made eating nearly impossible. Anything with flavor stung the tiny cuts in her mouth, leaving us with few dietary options that weren't tepid or bland or mostly liquid, making 2000 calories harder than ever to achieve. When her sores got so bad that she couldn't swallow her painkillers, I crushed Vicodin with the back of a spoon and scattered the bright blue crumbs over scoops of ice cream like a narcotic sprinkles. Our table, once beautiful and unique, became a battleground of protein powders and glorified gruel, dinner time a calculation and an argument to get anything down. This obsession with my mother's caloric intake killed my own appetite. Since I'd been in Eugene, I'd lost 10 pounds. The little flap of belly my mom always pinched at had disappeared and my hair began to fall out in large chunks in the shower from the stress. In a perverse way, I was glad for it. My own weight loss made me feel tied to her. I wanted to embody a physical warning that if she began to disappear, I would disappear too. Thank you. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Hi, Rishi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, I think it's a really, I, I'm so happy that you agreed to read that. I agree that it's a, that's a tough passage, um, but that's also part of why I love it so much. For me, I think what was amazing about that is how much of the themes of the book you ended up encapsulating in such a short period, you know, between not just the relationship that you had with your mother and what your mother was going through, but um, the way you talked about food, which is obviously a big part of the, this book. And um, there's something I thought really moving about how food ends up being this vehicle uh, for, you know, it, it transitions from like this thing of memory and pleasure um, to being this thing of like sustenance and, and, and like the negotiation that you have to have with both like the food and your, your mother and her appetite. Um, the kind of, I guess, like the quotidian part of just like survival, how, how much of your focus um, that becomes when, when someone's going through this. I think you captured that really beautifully and, and somehow you got all of that in, you know, just a few paragraphs. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> One of the things I, I wanted to ask you about was um, your sense of duty, I guess, as a translator. Um, I think there are a few different places throughout the book, rather there are a few different worlds that you're translating from. Um, there's obviously there are Korean words and Korean foods and, and uh, elements from Korean culture that you, you sort of translate. There's also stuff from like indie rock culture. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think maybe there's also a really meaningful one. There's a moment in the book where you talk about how, how the world sort of separates between the people who have lost somebody, people who've lost their mother and people who haven't. And, uh, and that there's only a, there's a kind of understanding that only people in the first group have. Um, as somebody who lost my own mother recently, I like really came to appreciate that difference, you know, the, the, like what it meant uh, to cross that divide a few months ago myself. Um, but that seems like an act of translation too, that you have to, there are all these things that you've kind of lived and in the language of your book, you ended up um, sort of trying to explain for an audience. And sometimes you don't explain fully. Sometimes you just sort of let it happen. Anyway, this was something that while I was reading, I kept thinking about. I kept wondering what you were thinking about while you're doing that, like what your, what obligation you felt, what audience you were imagining reading this and like who needed things explained and, and what you needed to explain? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think it's different. It's funny because, you know, there were certain things that I was really cognizant of um, and certain things that I didn't think about at all. Like I remember uh, describing the Hato cards that my family used, uh, yeah. slamming them like a pog slammer. And my editor was like, forgive me, but I don't know what <laughs> Is and realizing that there that sort of generational gap and and what exactly I was um, working with here, um, but I knew that it was really important to me um, that I that I not include. Um, I really didn't want to fuck with italics, and I really didn't want to uh, mess with footnotes or quotations. And yeah, I feel like there's like there's something about it that feels. Um, I don't know, just like immediately exoticizing my experience in a way that I would never um, do in 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 day to day speak. So I, I feel like I just tried to express myself in the way that I would um, with a you know with a friend over a, a table of you know with drinks you know and and even if my friend was Korean, like a lot of a lot of the times, like if even my Korean American friends, even my full Korean American friends. Um, you know, there, there is like this sort of, there are a lot of things that are lost in translation. Like there, there's such a spectrum of um, being Asian American and, and knowing about your culture uh, in this way. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll speak with Korean American friends who don't know what I'm talking about or, or I won't understand what they're talking about. And so I tried to present that type of information as, as a kind of like aside. And it's like, if you want to know more about it, you'll ask me or in this case, like look it up later. And, and there is some privilege in us being a part of, you know, uh, a generation that has access to the internet. So if, if people are curious and want to know more about something, um, they can look it up. But I also wanted to, to a lot of times, like I would, I would say the, the word or like whatever food it was, and then just immediately follow it with whatever it is in English um, and not try to belabor it. And if it, it, only if it was like necessary. Um, and so, yeah, I thought about that a lot. I, I think that, you know, um, I just assumed that no one would get any of the indie rock <laughs> references. And so I just, I, I felt like, um, you know, like, especially the references that I make, like, you know, at, at one point when I'm in New York and I found out that my mother's sick, I'm staying at this very obscure indie band, um, called Level Up's House. And I think that there's maybe like, maybe if I'm being generous, probably 5,000 people in the world that know uh, who that band is. Um, I, hopefully none of them are watching, but uh, you know, I, I think that it, it didn't really matter who they were, who they were, what mattered was like who they meant, who, how they played a role in the story and, and what they meant to me. And I think even if you're someone who doesn't know who Karen O is, or you don't know who Modest Mouse um, are, you, you get a sense of what they mean to me. And if you do know them, it's just a fun, like 
insider piece of knowledge, be it if it's like something about being Korean or if it's something about uh, grief or if it's something about indie rock, it was like a kind of nod to them. But if you don't get it, there's plenty of other stuff for you. Um, and the feeling is there that like, if we were just having a conversation, you would follow along. That was like the reader that I had in mind, I guess. Yeah. It's so funny because, you know, the actually the, the place where I first like wrote in the margins asking this was that exact thing, the, the Huatu paragraph. <laughs> yeah. I have like right here, it's that part. And I wrote translations for whom? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and I, and then I had this other question because this is something that I think about with, with parts of sort of Indian culture. Um, is this, are these like explanations of, I guess specifically, right? In terms of the things um, that you learned from your mother, the process of sort of translating it for, for someone who might not know about it, what did it at all feel like a form of memory for you, a form of remembering? Because uh, I have this like such a strong connection to now any thing from my from my childhood that I learned about from my mom, where she explained, oh, this means this, this food tastes like this. Mm -hmm. Now it's taken on this whole other significance because now I'm not just telling somebody what it is. I'm kind of reliving that explanation that I got. Absolutely. I find that I, I do that all the time. And, and that is, you know, there's a big part of the book that, that maybe will make sense or not make sense to some people where I, I became constantly obsessed with this idea that I was becoming my mother in this, or like I had like, like absorbed her in a way after she had passed. And if, you know, the stuff that like, and, and for better, or for worse, like, I think everyone feels like, you know, oh my God, I'm becoming my mother. And, it, and if your mother is still alive, I think it, it's like this aggravation where like, oh God, I'm just like my mother. And for me, it's like, it's almost dangerous how exciting that is for me. Um, now that she's gone, like that, I feel like when I do something that, that reminds me of her, even if it's a negative thing, it's comforting for me <laughs> to, to, to do that. Like, uh, just like the same kind of nitpicking that I swore I would never do uh, is exactly what I, I, I do. Or some things, I'll say things exactly, or like in a kind of voice that she would say something or find something humorous that no one else finds humorous that is something that my mom would find humorous. Um, and I've just really come to love having those moments. They are like beautiful, um, just important experiences of, of memory. Uh, and it's the closest that we get, I think, to, to feeling close to them or near them. Um, and, and certain things are, are definitely like that with food. Like I will always have this memory of when my mom learned to make jajangmyeon for the first time, which is this black bean noodle dish that's like this Korean Chinese fusion, uh, she was like, the trick is that you have to add a lot of onions. And now every time I make that dish, I'm like, the trick is to <laughs> use a lot of onions. Or every time we go to a Korean restaurant and we ordered pajeon, which is like a, you know, basically a Korean scallion pancake, uh, she would always say like, oh, you have to say pasak pasak which is like crispy, like make sure that it's crispy. So every time I order that dish or someone wants to order that dish at the table, I have to say, it's like, um, I just have to say it to the the, the waiter, like, uh, oh, pasak, pasak, please. Like, because it just feels like, you know, I am like channeling her in, in this way. Um, yeah. and, and, and she 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 would have like wanted that to be in part of it. <laughs> um, was your mom superstitious? She was, I think. Um, I like my mom was weirdly, and this is another big part of the book. Um, so much of the Korean American community, I don't know if this is like this in Indian culture, but uh, so much of the, the Korean American with with other religions, but with um, so much of the Korean American community is, is rooted in the Christian community. And my aunts were very Christian. Um, and, you know, in, in Eugene, uh, it's a very small Korean American community but it's all tied together by the Christian church and all of the Korean school is, is, is held there every Friday, you go to the Korean church and every Sunday you're supposed to go to the Korean church. And my mom turned away from religion like pretty early on um, when we lived there. Uh, and I'd never really thought to ask why or, or really like thought much about it. And in retrospect, and especially in writing this book, I realized like, how brave and bold of a decision that was for her to turn away from because as an immigrant who's like natural tied to her community of people is through this religion and to still decide you know this isn't for me I'm turning my back on that was um 
was pretty interesting. Um, I forget why, why I went into this direction. I was just curious, if, you know, when you like the the insistence to do things a certain way, the, the way your mom told you to do it, or the way uh, that you remember her doing it, or, you know, mm. ah, which is super talking about it sounds yeah. like yeah. almost like a super, you know, it's this combination of feels like ritual and honor and also superstition that like you have to do it right there's so many my parents are very superstitious mm -hmm. and there are things that I do not because I actually believe them but like I've inherited their superstitions and it's almost like I have to do them out of respect for their their sense of tradition not like it's even a religious thing or anything right. but just right. because they're religious people and I don't want to dishonor them by not doing the absolutely illogical thing that they've always told me to do. I mean, I feel like that is what, where I was getting it was, my mom was not a religious person, but she was a superstitious person. So she did believe in, she like weirdly believed in reincarnation. And she also um, believed in little things. Like if you shake your leg, I think she just found it to be irritating mostly, but if you shake your leg, you're shaking the luck out. So every time I was like nervously shaking my leg, she would grab my thigh and be like, stop shaking the luck out. And now as I'm older, like if I see someone doing that, it really bothers me. Um, and I, and I always like have to really keep myself from like grabbing their leg and be like, you'll shake the luck out. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go back for, for a second to, to the beginning of the process of, of writing for you, you know, before the book, even, um, I know you wrote songs. I've heard the songs that you've written, you know, in the, in the time after your mom passed away. Um, and you talk so much about your relationship to music in the book, throughout the book. But one thing that uh, only kind of gets a passing mention is your, you turning to words mm -hmm. and writing prose about this. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned an essay that you, that you wrote that is in Glamour Magazine. And I was wondering if you could talk about the moment when you decided to actually turn to that form of expression, um, if that was something that had been present for you for a long time if creative writing outside of a songwriting context had been something you'd always engaged in or some, as something new I think that I <laughs> I said this in another interview before and and she really laughed at me because in some ways I felt like being a writer or be, aspiring to be a writer was an even loftier goal than aspiring to be a musician <laughs> which seems quite silly I guess um when that I say sense to me, that, I, yeah, I, um, I think it was just my my ambitions for being a musician were pretty low, you know. I, I never anticipated. I've gone far beyond um, where I ever I ever even hoped to go uh, as a musician, and, and certainly as a writer. But I, I I was always I always liked writing. I liked telling stories, and I think even when I became when I started writing songs, my main interest had always been in the in the writing element, in the writing of lyrics, and the writing of these types of stories. And even when I learned how to play guitar, I remember as soon as I like learned my first three chords, I was I was off to to write songs, and it was always just a vehicle for songwriting. And never I never really even, you know, have considered myself a, a musician for many years because I I always just identified as being a songwriter first and foremost. But I studied, um, you know, I studied writing and, and loved writing and, uh, from like middle school through high school. I. Uh, was a part of the school newspaper and an editor. So for a long time, I thought in order to be a writer, the the sort of realistic thing was to become a journalist. And so I went um, to Bryn Mawr College and, and my idea was that I would be an English major and, and it would eventually parlay into journalism. Um, and then I found, um, I met Daniel Torde, who was my creative writing professor. And um, I just fell in love with creative writing courses uh, tr tremendously and, and he became such a mentor to me and I took every single class that he offered and and he suggested you know that I, I create my own major so I, I would never have to um take another uh, English course because I really just liked uh creative writing courses and it's funny because I took every single fiction course that he I took every single creative writing course he offered except for nonfiction because I mm -hmm. never thought I I was just really uninterested in it I never thought I would write nonfiction because I felt like as a mixed race person, there would be way too much pretext um, that I was just completely uninterested in explaining. I didn't want to write stories about identity. I didn't want to write stories about race. I wanted to write like 
gritty sort of realist fiction like Philip Roth and like John Updike and Tobias Wolf. And um, I just never thought I would ever write about myself. And, you know, I thought maybe someday I might write like a short fiction collection, but around the same time, you know, music really took a hold of me and, and it, it was the medium that I felt the most comfortable with and uh, made the most sense like forging a career path on. Um, because I was, you know, you're in the scene and all of your friends are doing it and, and it's easy to get shows. And even if you're only making like 50 bucks, you're like still making money in this way that like felt even more impossible in, in writing. Um, and it wasn't until my mom passed away uh, in 2014. I moved to New York in 2015. I got a job at uh, this place called Colossal Media in New York. And um, it was selling wall space to advertisers <laughs> and, and uh, trying to make the walls and the neighborhoods appealing so so buyers would buy them. I was a sales assistant. And I was just miserable. I would work from like, you know, eight to seven and I would and I would do the sweet green at the desk, like, you know, like shoveling salad into my mouth, like working constantly. And I would go home and I just would feel like I accomplished nothing at all. And I felt just so empty, even though I had been there all day working. And so around that same time, I was like mixing psychopomp and, and learning how to cook through these Mangchi videos. And, and I just thought it was a really cute story, really. Just like, it's like my Korean Julie and Julia. And, and it, it, I wanted to write this ode to this woman that I'd never met that had come to mean so much to me. And that was the first time that I, you know, I returned to writing and wrote, you know, nonfiction for the first time. And in the process of writing that, I think I just realized like, oh my God, there's just such a story here. There's so so much that I have like yet to unpack emotionally and so much that I can't communicate in my day to day uh, that led me to believe that I would, I would figure out a lot and learn to get so much off my chest if I, if I wrote it down in, in a full book. Yeah, that's so, so interesting given what, we're like where we started with the conversation because I really feel you about that thing of like, I can't write about my identity mm -hmm. because it just, you know, you have to have 50 pages of explanation before you can start the story or something like that. Um, but then you've managed, you managed to do that. <laughs> you managed to do that, you know, from the first page to the last page and it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like pretext and it feels like the text. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, if you felt like writing songs fed into that be because you have written so many autobiographical songs. Or did you also have in your mind that you were going to write sort of the, the Philip Roth, like gritty, realistic version <laughs> of fictional songs, you know, a concept album or something like that, too? I think it's both, for sure. I mean, I definitely learned a lot from that type of literature. And, it, and it's definitely, I feel like, all over my style of writing. And um, But yeah, I mean, I think that being a musician is like pretty, it's an interesting job. And it's an interesting medium because I think more than any other medium, um, people expect to really know you at the end um, or people really uh, feel this sort of um, ownership of your person and, and your life story. And it comes to mean more if it's real um, and, and they infuse so much of your identity in, into what you do as a musician, whether or not uh, you meant it to be or not. I think that a lot more of my songs are are fictional than people realize. Um, but I think that one of the beauties of, of of getting to make an album is that you get to really float in and out of of um, both of that those styles uh, in a very natural way. Um, you know, I didn't realize like how impressionistic like music making is in comparison to to writing prose and. Uh, <clears throat> how 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 difficult writing a book would would be compared to to writing an album, but they certainly are in conversation with each other and and, and definitely inform each other in some ways. There's one decision decision that you have to make that um, that I kept on thinking about as as I was getting further and further into the book, um, which was where does this book end? Where does mm -hmm. the story end? Because one of the things that that you know. I'm, I've come to understand, and I think we get to read you experiencing, is that you know there is no there is no neat end point to grief. Grief just and continues. I mean, you you have a really beautiful line in there about it about being buried with it, um, and I and I was thinking, so how do you how do you find a point when you're writing about grief? Like, what was what was that? 
process like for you to, to figure out where the book ends? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't always know, certainly. And, and there were some parts of the book that were even kind of happening in real time um, and that made their way into the book. Um, I submitted the rough draft in May of, I think May of 2019 um, or the late summer. And it was, it ended with actually the penultimate chapter uh, where I'm just uh, sort of crying in that house. Yeah. There was a lot bleaker before and I, I wasn't sure about it. It, it felt um, like unfinished in some ways, but it, you know, it, 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 I think it, it would have worked. I don't think it's as good, but um, <laughs> my editor, you know, was like, I don't know if the story ends here and, and sort of pushed me to continue going. I think for a long time, I was really resistant to writing about my my life as a musician at all um, and my career as a musician because I didn't want people to think um, that this was like a musician's memoir because it's not, you know, I happen right. to be a musician in the same way that I sort of happen to be Korean and, and they're about those things, but it's not. Ultimately, it's a story about a mother and, and daughter and, and um, caretaking and grief and, um, yeah, I just, I, I didn't want people to think like, who does she think she is? She's like, you know, 32 years old and like she has, you know, three albums under her belt. And I, I don't consider myself to be like Patti Smith or Jeff Tweedy or Carrie Brownstein, these people who have had like these sort of legacy careers. Um, but it is a big part of my life, you know? And, and, I, and I, I came to realize that it was a major part of my relationship with my mom in a way and my, my sense of belonging and, and a major point of contention for us when I was an adolescent and ultimately a big part of why we drifted sort of away from each other during that time period. Um, and so I think that coming back to it and sort of giving myself permission to write about it um, and explain, you know, the sort of more serendipitous part of this whole experience was that <clears throat> my mom was so concerned about me never making it as a musician and it was only until she passed away that, you know, all of this stuff started happening for me and she never got to see me become successful as a musician. And so much of the book is about grappling with, you know, not, not feeling a sense of belonging anywhere, not quite ever belonging in America and not ever quite feeling like I belong in Korea and really struggling to discover that for myself that eventually just came to me that where I feel like I belong the most is is in a space that I've created for myself as an artist and being on on a stage that I you know that I've worked up to um from the, from the work that I put in and the space that I've made for myself I think is ultimately uh where I found my sense of belonging and why I was just so drawn um to becoming an artist and why it was so like relentlessly important to me was because I was sort of searching for that feeling and, and, and looking to find my people. And it was only when I, I made the space for myself and, and shared it with people that I like found my people and I found a place where I really belong. And so it felt like a, a perfect place to sort of end. And um, it, you know, it ends with a very bittersweet moment of something that was also incredibly important to me, which, which was getting to be a lot closer to my um, aunt and, and, and feeling like I'm sort of embodying my mother for the both of us. Um, so yeah, I just, it, I wandered my way into there and was like, this looks okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> it's great, the ending is so good. Thank you. I think you could, I do agree, you could have ended the chapter before and it would have been a beautiful ending, but but you know, you, you open up a window before the before the very end of the story, and I, I, I do appreciate it. Um, I was wondering. So, this is partly me also working out my things that I've been thinking about too. Uh, but because, like a few weeks after my mom passed away, I had a dream about her, and I ended up writing a song about that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in the place where I'm like three months into that into that song. You know what I'm like working working on it and working on it and revising it. Um, and let me get back to your book, actually. But so, like, you have written this really beautiful tribute. I think it, you, you have captured your mom in a very three-dimensional way, and the complexities of who she is and, and her relationship. And but it is like such a loving portrait in all of that. Um, and it feels really emotional. Um. The writing is, is so beautiful and just what you're saying feels emotional. But I know 
that with anything that you make, you know, that comes out of an emotional experience, at a certain point, you have that like that flood of emotion. And then there's a part where it's just the work of like refining and polishing and stuff like that. And I wondered, was it while you were doing that, did you end up feeling like a disconnect from the sort of initial emotional part? Because now you're just doing the kind of the grinding of like word choice and things like that? Or, or did it always feel as profoundly emotional while you were in it? That's a great question. I feel like it it ran the gamut of like every emotion that anyone could possibly feel. I was very emotional for parts of it and very unemotional for part of it. When I submitted the book, honestly, and I think that this is like really great advice for any artist is like, um, you know, I was just devastated when I turned this book in. I felt like I had, when I turned in the final draft, um, I felt like I had just completely failed uh, myself and my mother and her memory. And um, I just always felt like I was like reaching for this ideal language or like expression that I could just like never quite reach. And, and um, I just felt endlessly so stupid <laughs> writing this book. And, you know, I, and eventually I just had to really like talk myself down from the cliff and be like, you know what, this is who you are as an artist right now. And I feel like so much of our making is, is that, is reckoning with that. It's just like, this is an archive of who you are as an artist in this moment. You spelt, you've spent four to six years writing this and you can't take forever with it. You have to let it go at some point in time. And, you know, ultimately like this is just where you're at in this time and, and, and you have to be there in order to get to the next place and the next project and, and, and you know, all of, take all of the lessons that you take from this into, into that next project. I feel like I've seen so, I feel like at some point you have to just let it go, you know? And um, yeah, I, I feel like that, I, you know, that's advice I wanna give to my friends all the time because I have friends that, um, I don't know if this is what you're going through. Uh, I might be projecting. But um, I feel like my friends just like, they tinker and tinker away forever to like make this perfect thing. And it's never gonna happen, you know? Like at some point, uh, it's so important to, to learn to let it go. And then months will go by and you'll feel like a real failure. And one morning you'll wake up and listen to it or reread it and realize like, it's pretty good, you know? Like at some, at some point you have to just like let it go. And I, and I feel like I was just at, at that point, at that point um, when I finally turned it in where I was just like, it's just time to, I have no perspective anymore and I have to just let it go. And parts of it were so emotional and parts of it were totally devoid of feeling, you know? But part, part, part of writing the stuff that was devoid of feeling was actually really exciting because it was like real craft. Um, I, one of the things I absolutely loved uh, that was a note that my editor gave me after the first um, draft was like, I wish you talked more about the weather. And I was like, what is she talking about? What, what, huh. what like how, who writes about the weather? What is there to say about the weather? How am I gonna remember what the weather was like in like May of 20, you know, 14? Um, and then I went and I reread, uh, I think I reread Rock Springs by Richard Ford and Marilyn speaking. And I only underlined all of the lines about the weather to just see like how they did it. And then I went back in and reread my book and just like started writing <laughs> about the weather, like to color the scenes. And uh, it did, it just made it so much better. It grounded you in the time period. It made it made time feel like it was passing. It made it feel like you were more in the moment and and uh, like could feel the air or see the sky. And um, a lot of the times it's just really simple, like one liners about like how, what color the sun is, you know what I mean? But like, it just, it does so much and, and stuff like that, that was like pretty, you know, devoid of feeling of just like inserting crafty moments uh, was actually really, really gratifying. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> That's awesome. So I don't know if this is a question that is totally fair because I don't know how you can get away with it. I don't know how, how anyone can, get, I mean, get away from it. But did you ever feel a sense of, um, a sense of guilt for writing, for basically taking th this tragic thing that you know this moment of your mother's life 
and base and ma- using it as fodder for your art. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I feel like there's even there's even a passage in the book where I, I sort of call out that moment where, um, you know, there's actually a song on Psychopomp called Moon on the Bath that's like this instrumental and it has a voice recording of my mom's voice. Um, and I had recorded that conversation. <laughs> I had recorded that conversation. I was in Philadelphia and she had called me and told me that her cancer was terminal. And my instinct was to record this conversation, you know? And in my mind, you know, we were planning a trip to Jeju Island. Um, I was actually really upset today. And so I'll just air this grievance today because uh, it, I've, I think so much of who I am as an artist um, comes from this like real fear of being misunderstood and this real desire for understanding. And, you know, someone had written something about how, you know, Zahner comes off as, as a little selfish sometimes because she suggests this trip to Korea, which is not something that I did. My parents wanted to go to Korea as a sort of last trip for her to say goodbye to her family and, and um, experience uh, Seoul and uh, again, and, and you know, it was, she was in kind of better health. It was like the second chemo was over, the side effects had kind of subsided. She was deciding to discontinue treatment and felt like she could, could really enjoy herself in Korea for a couple of weeks, ended up being a terrible mistake. Um, uh, sorry, I keep getting lost, but um, yeah, I, I recorded that conversation because I was like, I'll, I'll make a documentary about this experience, you know, and um, I, I was recording this conversation and I had this very ugly moment where I was like, what are you doing? You know, like you need to be present in this moment and not document this experience. And so I didn't, you know, I stopped recording. I kept the recording and I just thought, you know, just be present and don't think about this. Um, and, and, and from then on, I, I, I just was, I was there and I was present and I was with her and I didn't, I didn't work on anything. And it was a strange period of time for me in in many ways, but largely because of that as well. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, like the December after she passed away that I started writing this record and, and sort of, um, poking at those kinds of wounds. And I just, you know, like that's who, that's just intrinsically a who I am, you know, like, and, and I don't know if that makes me an egomaniac or like incredibly selfish, but um, that's like how I cope. And that's how I, I, you know, compartmentalize things. That's how I grieve. That's how I uh, move forward and make sense of things. And um, I think that a lot of the amazing art that I love are all these people who do that. And I guess I just use those people to make myself feel better about what I'm doing. But I think that the art that I love are is 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 art that's like really rooted in 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 reality in this way. And I think ultimately I had to work really hard to be um as generous as possible as I could even towards people that um I really had a lot of anger towards and really resented um you know because and and in a way it was an exercise in, in trying and I, I feel like I do this a lot it's like an exercise in trying to understand where they're coming from and also defines like what my flaws were in that situation because no one wants to ex- it, it's a hard thing and no one wants to expose that they were wrong uh or that they behaved poorly but you can't have a successful book I think if if the protagonist or 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 yourself like isn't examined in in the same sort of discerning eyes as everyone else is and I think that it's completely unbelievable um, if you don't expose every ugly thing that you do. And that was part of the reason why that was such an important passage in the book for me was um, that is definitely a, a thing I look down on myself a lot of, of, of using this as fodder for, for sure. Um, and that is, it is partially a gift and, and, and partially a major flaw, certainly. It's a huge gift to us, you know, and I, I, as I've told you, before, you know, before we, when we were texting, just like how important this book has been for me, I've certainly got, uh, you know, a lot selfishly out of your instinct to make this because, um, I don't know, d- between losing my mom recently and the relationship that I had with her food and, you know, my, my heritage, uh, so recently, it's just been incredibly meaningful to me to be able to help myself like process that through your 
eyes and your book, you know, it, um, there was so much that I was able to relate to and, um, and I guess <laughs> it, it gave me a little bit of distance from it in a, in a way while also holding me close to it, you know, that I, I it was really uh, incredibly meaningful to me. And so, um, I was wondering about that that sense of guilt, but I also want to definitely alleviate you from any feeling of it because of what you gave us with the book. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. I'm so sorry. Um, we're going to uh, take some questions. There's a Q&A function if you haven't seen that yet in, in the chat. Um, and I'm going to just uh, ask some, some of your questions now to, to Michelle. Uh, Jason has asked, if you decide to write a second book, any idea what topics or experiences you would focus on? And uh, my question too is like, is are we gonna will we get the gritty, the gritty realistic you know fictional novel? <laughs> um, yeah, I I don't know. I feel like even more. It's funny now that I've like written a, a book of nonfiction. It's hard for me to to think back of my my years writing fiction and 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 know how to even begin to take that on. Also, I feel like I. Uh, everyone might be so disappointed if I, if I took that direction. Um, but yes, I think that I absolutely will write a second book. Um, maybe not anytime soon, but uh, I feel like it's just so exciting to get to learn so much about this process. And, and so much of what I took away from writing this book was like, I can't wait to apply the lessons that I've learned uh, to, to a new project um, because I've, I've just learned so much about the writing process. And, and now I just have that sense of courage, um, similar to making albums of just like knowing that I, I've seen this through and that it's possible and that, you know, not to, to, to get too worried. Um, but yeah, I think that it really, um, I don't know if it's like, if I should not give this away, but I feel like a real where the book leaves off for me is like, I really, um, I'm now really interested in, in the Korean language and I have like so much regret of not um, committing myself to learning the language. And um, I feel like I would love to, if I don't make a project out of it, I may never do it. Um, and so I would love to write, uh, I would love to move to, to Korea for a year and, and document my experience um, uh, learning the language uh, and, and, and process of doing that. I also think that after writing a memoir, I would love to write something that's like happening in present time <laughs> and doesn't require the sort of like excavating of memory because it's so much easier to write about things um, that are, you know, uh, currently happening and, and, and documenting that and then revisiting it and, and structuring it into a book, I think uh, is really enticing to me. Um, have you read any Pico Ayer? Uh, he's like yeah. an incredible, I believe he's, he's an Indi like a British Indian man who like moved to Japan and he wrote this incredible book uh, called, I think it's called The Beginner's Guide to Japan, which sounds so bad, but, um, and it sounds just like a travel book, but it's like all of these like really clever observations of like Japanese culture and, um, you know, being a foreigner in Japan uh, and, and what you can sort of parse from those like cultural like observations about like the culture deep deeper as a whole um i i, I highly recommend it um okay. but uh yeah I, I would love to do some something more along along those lines i think that would be my my next interesting project awesome um okay here's a question earlier you mentioned that you cautioned not to exoticize your experience or understanding of korean food that said i wonder how you think about quote authenticity in terms of food ways and food culture, and also in relation to identity. And if I can add one uh, note of my own to that too, I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about the idea not to italicize mm -hmm. words in Korean, you know, and, and what that was like. That's a little bit more, I know, um, sort of uh, more of a specific question, but I'd love to get to that too. If, if you can find a way. Sure, I'll address that quickly because it's it's pretty simple. I feel like it was just an intuitive feeling where it's like, if I see an italic like Korean word, like tteokguk, like it, I guess it just, it it makes me feel like um, I'm like putting on like, like a really uh, put on like poet voice, you know, like tteokguk. Like I just feel like every time I like read, read an italic, I'm like, 
And then I ate jajangmyeon. Like, <laughs> like, this, like I, I, obviously not everyone has that experience, but like every time I read something like that, it really bothers me and gives me that note. So I knew that like, I didn't want to do that because like the food is just like, it's just a part of the conversation. It's not like having its moment. Um, so that was why I didn't want to do um, italics. Uh, I was definitely in writing this book, the most concerned about um, the Asian American reader and especially the Korean American reader, because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to feel, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't want to be a cultural ambassador and I also didn't want to, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to exoticize our, like that experience at all. And I, and I definitely was like wary of that because, you know, um, I wanted, but I felt like ultimately all I, all I could do was just like create the most honest detailed portrait to, to present like a multifaceted uh, series of characters and family. Uh, and that's all you can really do to like uh, escape these sort of tropes. Like how else, how else would I write this story? This is exactly what happened, you know? And I didn't try to like uh, beef up any, <laughs> any, any parts really um, for, for anyone in particular, but I, I was, you know, I was definitely like nervous about um, in particular the Asian American reader and, and, and doing that. Um, you know, and, and another part of it is like, uh, I think like a younger me, even just like a year ago would, would, would um, you know, would, would, would like, I understand uh, arguments of like authenticity and I understand the importance of authenticity because a lot of the times it's like in the face of um, basically like white people, like, you know, profiting off of our culture and uh, doing it badly, you know? So like it, nothing pisses me off more than I like, find a Korean restaurant in town and it's like a Korean, you know, like, yeah, like a, like a, like a carrot slaw kimchi or like whatever. Um, mostly just cause I'm disappointed and it's like, I'm not trying to like gatekeep my culture, but it, you know, it just personally for me, it's like just disappointing to have to confront. I don't think that there's like anything wrong with like trying to like creatively express yourself. And I think there's a lot of Korean people who are doing this with Korean, Korean food too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the, the real answer to that. I will just say that like, I think that authenticity, talking about authenticity is like a slippery slope because, you know, there's such a spectrum of like what being Asian or Asian American could mean that like to talk about something being authentic, like I think can also be like something that really is, is gatekeeping in a way, you know, like I, I feel like there are Korean people or Asian people who have sort of like gate kept me from my own culture, you know, saying that like, you know, like I'm, as a mixed person, like it's impossible for me to be like authentic anything, you know? And does that like, you know, I feel like that, that or like to be a Korean adoptee, like do they not have, you know, they don't maybe like, like I, my, my friend Elise Whitney like wrote this like piece of like how much kimchi do I have to eat to prove that I'm, you know, Korean or like she, she has, she really struggles with um, eating spice because she was like, she didn't, she wasn't raised to eat it like with her, her adopted family. And so um, I think that there is some danger in a way of, of like praising authenticity in, in, in some ways, because I think it, uh, it gatekeeps a lot of like the sort of spectrum of the Asian American experience. Yeah, that's really well said. Um, I will say maybe for your second book, <laughs> go to Korea, but write about your experience being a slam poet. <laughs> and and so I only way, say Korean foods in a town. Italics, yeah, the whole book. <laughs> the next time when I get to talk to you about that book, you do your reading, it's really dramatic. <laughs> yes, that's what <awesome>. Kimchi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to see it one more time. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have time for maybe one, one more question. Uh, let, me, let me look through the <laughs> Q&A here. <laughs> Um, okay, so Esme writes, as an Asian American playwright, I've been finding it very difficult to try to create work about survivorhood, grief, and identity during a time when we're particularly vulnerable. Any advice for how to take care of oneself emotionally while creating work related to a very stressful current moment? Ooh, loaded question. Um, I think it's tough. I think that for me, like, I, I really struggle with... Um, <laughs> I think I place so much of an importance on um, my work ethic that that is just how I um, 
it's just been an anchor for me always to, to stay afloat or an anchor to stay afloat. Um, (laughs) It's just been an anchor for me to like guide myself through um, difficult times. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, that way for anyone else, but I I find like creating like small goals or or regimens are, uh, this is maybe so boring, but having like routines, um, and like really small goals, I think is important. And also just like taking a cold, hard look at yourself and being like, it's okay to not do anything today. You know, like uh, that is like a real thing I've had to confront in like the last few weeks of just like, if you don't want it, if it doesn't feel right for you to do stuff, you know, you work very hard and it's okay to like take time for yourself. Um, that's like really the only like advice that I have, I think um, is, is just, um, for me right now, like things are so hard. It's been a really, really hard year for everyone and for so, so many different reasons. And um, the only way that I, I have managed to like stay grounded, I think is just by creating like really small uh, regimens uh, for myself, even if it's just like read 20 pages of a book or 50 pages of a book a day, or like do a little YouTube exercise <laughs> or like, you know, uh, take care of yourself and plan like a themed dinner um, on Fridays or whatever, like things to look forward to and enjoy, I think are, are just really important right now. Okay. I have one last question. Um, I know how busy it can be when you're doing stuff like this, you know, when you're doing a lot of press and you're doing events and things like that. I was wondering, have you been able to still incorporate your love of cooking at this time in your life, you know, when, when you're this busy, is there still space for that? Or do you just have to kind of be like, well, okay, that's, that's not a part of my life right <laughs> at the moment. I will say I've been ordering a lot of takeout uh, this month and I haven't gotten to cook too much, but when I, when I do get to, and I, and I really hope to f- sort of like carve out that space for myself, especially as like the weather changes. Uh, I feel like I, I always get really inspired to cook. Um, when the weather changes, like a new a new menu arrives. So I am really yeah. looking forward to engaging that. I was hoping that your last question was going to be, are we best friends now? Oh, <laughs> see, I never ask. I just assume that <laughs> it's only later that I get disappointed because I'm just like, obviously we are. <laughs> <laughs> we're best friends now, Rishi. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. I'm glad, glad to know we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for talking to me. Thanks for thank letting you so me much be a part of this conversation. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much to the Asian American Writers Workshop. And thank you to Books Are Magic. And thank you everyone who came. I really appreciate it. Thank you both so much. I love ending on this note of two new best friends, which is always <laughs> at the end of an event. Um, it's already happening on Zoom, but I do want to call for a round of virtual applause in the chat for Michelle and for Rishikesh. Thank you both so much for such an incredible conversation. Um, I also just want to call out and thank everybody who's online with us. The chat has been, there's been so much care and resource sharing um, and real generosity in the chat. We're grateful for your joining us and to share this space with you all tonight. Um, I just have a couple of very quick closing notes from the workshop. Um, If you enjoyed this program, I hope you'll join us again. On Monday, April 26th, we're gonna stream a really incredible conversation between scholar Kaji Amin and poet, memoirist and translator Rajiv Mohabir as part of our Radical Thinker series. On Tuesday of next week, the 27th, we present another installment of our Mouth to Mouth Open Mic series, which is hosted and curated by Kay Ulande Barrett. You can RSVP for these events and more at aawworg events. Um, I want to thank our friends at Books Are Magic once again. There are links in the chat, although you may need to scroll up a little bit um, to purchase Michelle's book. I believe they have signed copies as well. So hope you will get one of those. Um, And I want to thank so much um, our ASL interpreters, Chris and Christine, and our captioner, Zach, for helping us make this event accessible. Finally, and quickly, this event was recorded. It will be available shortly on our YouTube channel and on our podcast, AAWW Radio, if you'd like to revisit it or share with friends. Um, And we are going to turn off our cameras, but leave the Zoom open for about five or 10 minutes so you can hang out in the chat and connect with other audience members if you'd like. Um, And if you would prefer to sign off, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope you have a great night. We hope you take care. 
Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.